We have three presenters, and um, I think if we keep the presentations to about, uh, what, 17 minutes? Does that sound reasonable mm -hmm. enough? That'll be about 10, 15 minutes for questions. And so we'll just go in order. First, we have uh, Marco Adrian. Um, and the uh, title of his paper is Capital Logistics in the World. And, no, I'm sorry, Capital Logistics in the Word. That would be capital, comma, logistics, comma, in the Word. Social media as a literary form. So, yes, it's hard to find the room, and also this is known as the first session after the beer tasting. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, what I'm going to talk about today uh, is the status of the word in the age of social media. And I'm, I'm sure that uh, it's no surprise that um, social media or online text represents a kind of speed up. And so what I'm going to talk about today is how we can perhaps understand that speed up and I'll even provide a metaphor at the end from literature uh, that I found helpful for understanding the, the character and nature of the speed up of the word. So uh, from my perspective, James Carey really uh, allows us to begin to think about uh, speed. Uh, and he talked a lot about the telegraph, but his, his overall theme was that a new medium affords innovation in logistics. And so you're able to move the word around quickly. You're able to organize people and things uh, more quickly. And that's the kind of basis for how uh, uh, things are sped up uh, in the world. Um, and I think we can say these are my three main points for the talk. But the, the second point uh, that uh, we can continue to look at how uh, social media influences the written word and literature uh, by paying attention to the movement of social and economic capital. So uh, just in the same way that Kerry kept an eye on kind of the in, kind of industry and uh, the material economy, uh, we can do the same as we uh, think about social media and its relationship to literature. Uh, and I think it's a kind of a theme in media ecology meetings, but retrievals from history are really useful for understanding these changes. So we can go to the next one. I would say that uh, uh, transformation uh, of literature occurs in terms of methods and style. Uh, for Carey, uh, he said that the telegraph made prose lean and unadorned. And scholars since then have kind of given attention to the way that the telegraph really changed the nature of communication uh, in the sense that uh, uh, we became more businesslike, we became more attentive to uh, economy in prose. Um, and uh, again, the movement of capital in space is also transformed. Uh, the, the key example that uh, Carey provides of the effect of the telegraph was that. Before the telegraph, it was much easier to make money by buying cheap in one location and selling uh, at a higher price in another location because people uh, had to actually move around uh, to, to find out what prices were in different regions. So, you, so the, ar the opportunities for arbitrage were uh, arbitrage, meaning buying cheap and selling higher in another uh, location. Those opportunities are reduced or they're sped up you know, in a way. Uh, people do it much more quickly and because of the because of the information available about prices. Uh, and similarly, commoditization of the novel begins in the 19th century. Uh, and for example, uh, just in terms of publishing policy, it was after the telegraph that publishers began to actually pay a percentage for uh, uh, for, for what a, an author had written based on the number of units sold. Before that, they, they didn't actually give a lot of attention. Uh, to, to how many books are being sold. After that, the author would earn according to uh, books sold. So, uh, just uh, these are just a couple of examples that occurred to me 
the telegraph invented in 1837. Uh, before 1837, uh, Frankenstein and the last of the Mohicans, a kind of romantic view of nature and kind of uh, notions of uh, uh, how nature may be uh, undermined and perhaps there's danger uh, in, in the mists of the forests and, and so on. Uh, Frankenstein being the, the, the uh, uh, major source of fright uh, that, that, uh, that, uh, that, that life could be brought to, to, to bear uh, through, tech, through science. Then after 1837, uh, there's a much more journalistic, these are three works that the authors draw on much more journalistic style where they're actually recording and, and uh, thinking about what's happening on the streets of London uh, or elsewhere, and, and that's being transformed into, the, into their literature. Very interesting as well that uh, Dickens, um, much of his work was released on a serial basis. It would appear in newspapers, so bites, uh, so literature being became kind of uh, commoditized, chopped up, made more economical, made more business-like. Not, not to say these aren't great works of literature, they are obviously, but uh, uh, the, 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 the style has, has been transformed. Okay, I'll come on to the next one. Oliver Twist uh, published in monthly installments, uh, the journalistic concern for real life scenarios, uh, and uh, this, this sense of horror uh, becomes popular right after the, uh, the advent of the telegraph. So. So this speed up seems to be uh, associated with a certain amount of anxiety and angst and fear as to what we're what we're doing with with uh, uh, with the word and, and its uh, its relationship to uh, uh, relationship to to logistics and and uh, the movement of capital. Okay, on to the next one. So here's uh, something I'm going to read it for you. It's uh, after uh, 1837, but just it's just a, an anecdote here of, of how the sense of, of, of the sped up word kind of provides anxiety. Kind of funny, funny one, but on my arrival home late last evening, uh, something was put into my hands. So, so this person receives a, a telegraph that he didn't ask for. And what it does is it advertises that the dentists are going to be open late uh, in the next while. And this, this writer to the newspaper is, is shocked. He didn't ask for this telegraph. He didn't ask for this advertisement. And, and the way he puts it uh, is that this is an intolerable nuisance. A little, little bit of the, the anxiety, which is expressed uh, kind of in, in that kind of Victorian prose. You want to take a picture of that one? I can share slides too. I can share slide decks if you if you want, because I have the links for all of these uh, examples as well. That might be interesting. Okay. And as with the telegraph, again, retrieving from history, telegraph seems to be such a fertile example and metaphor. Uh, with uh, text and social media, it carries terms they arrive lean, unadorned, and sped up. Uh, the focal of online text is the list. And of course, uh, if you want to kind of get a sense of how things go viral, you want to go to BuzzFeed, uh, which, which has these, these very um, refined uh, lists. Um, and uh, the Buzz, BuzzFeed algorithm monitors 120 million uh, uniques, which are, which are uh, uh, items that are new or, or different uh, in, from all of these uh, markets. And uh, what it does, is, what BuzzFeed does, is it identifies which of these uniques are speeding up, and then it, it gives prominence to them in its algorithm. And that's how things go viral. But it's pretty hard to find something that goes viral that is not listed. So again, back to this transformation of style, uh, the kind of uh, uh, economical uh, and uh, unadorned text of, of the list is, is important. So my son, the doctoral student, uh, this is uh, not my son, but this is someone's son 
the founder of BuzzFeed actually wrote this very interesting article in a journal. Uh, who's to say that, you know, if you publish in a critical theory journal, it won't actually have some relevance to something. Uh, and what he, what he wrote about, and of course he's, he's become very wealthy uh, with, with BuzzFeed, uh, capitalism and schizophrenia. So he understood at an early stage uh, that uh, uh, speeding up the word uh, has certain consequences for individuals and for groups and for society. And that is that there is this sense of a loss of consciousness of, of, of identity. Uh, and that could be related to this kind of anxiety or fear that, that uh, uh, people feel. It's schizophrenia. He, 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 what he's saying is that uh, with all of these uh, authors out there, many of which are hard to pin down. After all, who actually writes things that are on the web? They're all being mixed up and added to and passed on. Uh, that uh, the, there's a loss of identity. Uh, so, the, so he calls it the acceleration of identity formation and dissolution. So he understood what he was doing. Very interesting. Uh, just a, a kind of an illustration of, of how uh, we might be reading BuzzFeed and other uh, items online. Uh, you know, it's this, that, and the other. The idea of, of a sort of stable identity is, is certainly uh, uh, being questioned in, in uh, online media, social media. So I would say we can begin to think about metaphors that the author becomes a zombie or ghost. We're not actually sure who the author is. And so we can talk about an authorless voice. For religion, the, the mimamsa in Hindu philosophy is, is this idea of an authorless voice. There's a voice, but we don't know who's speaking. Uh, and of course, uh, zombies uh, are the iconic popular culture figure. Uh, they have no will of their own, and they're slaves. Um, in Haitian tradition, they're under the control of someone, but I think the zombies in popular culture, it's not actually clear who's in charge of them. Uh, Frankenstein is, is the progenitor of, of the zombie. Um, so again, although the traditional zombie is, is directed, these ones now seem to be active and, 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 and directed from something within themselves, but not really clear. They spread disease, uh, so there's, they are to be feared. And an example is uh, the Left 4 Dead video game series. So there's an, actually, uh, there's an interactive aspect to all of this. Uh, and of course, role playing, uh, people want to dress up as zombies and have zombie <coughs> Are you ready? Have you got the supplies you need for the zombie apocalypse? Do you have a fortified shelter? Do you have adequate footwear? Are you ready for the zombie apocalypse? So the audience, I would say, becomes a, a cipher, meaning that uh, we're trying to decode messages. And the literary critic Northrop Fye said the Bible was the great code. I think. I think that the code has, has changed, uh, and of course popular culture interested in the uh, code, the imitation game, this fascination with codes and code breaking. Alan Turing kind of coming back as a, as a, a figure in popular culture. And it's interesting that Douglas Colton, if you haven't read his biography of Marshall McLuhan, it's a really interesting, very short uh, 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 biography, but very good reading. Uh, and uh, he's one of his key themes is that McLuhan offers us a key to the internet. So it's uh, we, we won't necessarily understand the internet uh, fully, having read McLuhan, but we'll have a key to the internet. So this kind of a code uh, has has been there for a while. And the zip code in popular culture, of course, uh, zip codes and, and postal codes are used for marketing primarily now, that's why. And so in, in Ireland, uh, a lot of people are actually <coughs> resisting the postal codes because they see it as just a way of kind of organizing the territory uh, for marketing. Uh, so Peretti, the founder of uh, uh, BuzzFeed, uh, we're talking about aggregations, continually shifting points of view, and it's a form of automatic writing. McLuhan talked about the, the word medium and its, its, its meaning not in terms of uh, uh, 
people sitting around the table and waiting for the spirits to visit. So in spiritualism, spirits take control of the hand of a medium. Automatic writing is the ability to write without consciousness. And I'm going to move ahead, uh, Adam, to the next one. Um, this is this was the, the kind of again this anxiety and fear around. This, so this is a, a piece of equipment that allowed people to kind of uh, uh, do some automatic writing and, and have someone interpret that. To the next one. And so this this is what I'm going to leave you with. And again, I'm happy to share my slide deck if you just leave me your email address. This is from an Italian poet, uh, very well known in Italy. And so he's getting at what I would say is a good metaphor for uh, social media and the sped up word. Because what, what we have is this voice, but not clear who's speaking. So ventriloquist means stomach speaker. It's Latin. If you believe him, by God, you're gullible, as if the stomach were a place to chat in or speech could come from swallowing a syllable. I can't believe that in an age like ours when everybody's mouth is open, but, and he shifts here, he realizes something else. When nothing is said, anyone's got the power of saying anything with his mouth shut. His stomach talk, what is he trying to tell me? Only a poor beggar who hasn't once eaten today hears glub glub in his belly. Matter of fact, especially then, the month's almost out, my guts grumbling great. Know whose voice it is, the voice of the state. So, uh, Without focusing on Trilusa's uh, focus on, on the state, I mean, the voice is coming from somewhere. I mean, I, I mean at some point, we have to try to understand uh, who's speaking, even though it appears to come as, a, uh, as an authorless voice. And I think that's the, uh, I guess that's the uh, theme that I wanted to, to end with. Thank you. One more slide. Very nice photo of uh, ventriloquist from the 1920s. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Mark. Pardon me? Thank you so much. Okay, that was fascinating. Um, Hi, I'm the first one. I'm the first one. All right, very, very good. Uh, next, we have uh, Adam Kuchin from the University, okay. the University of Toronto. Uh, the title of his paper is Ezra Pound and the repetition of remix, projecting possibilities between the two fascisms. Slides in the uh, me reading my paper uh, is going to work rather unconventionally because I have time the slides to pass every 20 seconds, so it's not necessarily going to follow exactly you know in the way that I'm delivering my uh, my the progression of my argument. <coughs> um, but I hope it kind of uh, conceptualizes this presentation as a kind of remix. Um, so. While it may seem surprising, even troubling, to argue for the contemporary relevance of the early 20th century American poet Ezra Pound, uh, that's actually what I'm going to do in this presentation. Uh, of course, much of Pound's tarnished reputation has to do not only with the fact that his modernist poetry ranks with Joyce's Finnegan's Wake as the most impenetrable literature in the Western canon, uh, but also, and more importantly, with the fact that Pound, in keeping with the extreme politics of the period, uh, was an avid supporter of Italian fascism uh, and an idolizer of the dictator Benito Mussolini. So given these difficulties, it's natural to question why one would even attempt to resurrect the work of such an elitist and extremist poet, especially since much of contemporary artistic practice and theory articulates a self-conscious distancing from modernist poetics uh, and its urgency to break down hierarchical power structures uh, and open up fields of empowerment for diverse modes of um, reader and viewership. Uh, I'd like to argue, however, that while these positions are important, their reactionary posture as various anti-modernisms or post-modernisms prevents them from confronting the complex essence of the modernist moment, an essence which ironically can be seen in the way in which modernism already lays the ground uh, for the emancipatory politics and aesthetics of post-modernism. <clears throat> 
So in this sense, I claim that it is by failing to consciously repeat the modernist moment that postmodernism and more contemporary anti-modernisms really continue the fascist impulse of modernism in a more covert and dangerous form. And I don't know if you can really read these ones, but these are just examples of uh, the poetry of Ezra Pound. So I just wanted to um, uh, give you a glimpse of the really extreme fragmentation of Pound's method. But, like every line is kind of like a completely different cultural reference. So in order to investigate this ambiguous relationship between modernism and postmodernism, past and present, I will root my discussion in a crucial element that is essential to both cultural movements, and this is the uh, element of repetition and remix. So famously, McLuhan claims that the simultaneous action of electricity repeats or retrieves the experience of earlier cultural organizations, such as tribal communities and medieval oral culture. For such societies, past, present, and future did not flow in the linear sequence emphasized by the visually oriented printing press, uh, but instead constituted an auditory resonant order of simultaneous interplay, such that every moment to varying degrees contained within itself a repetition of the others. For McLuhan, the radical formal experimentations of the modernists were to acclimatize society to this uh, fundamental transformation and experience which could only manifest to a greater or lesser degree as a traumatic shock. So the work of Ezra Pound, who was a mentor not only to uh, T.S. Eliot, but to a host of other modernist artists and poets and writers, is perhaps the most profound expression of his cultural movement, both in the towering successes of Pound's poetry and in the catastrophic failures of his fascist commitments. So I find the importance of McLuhan's insight is that uh, it allows us to understand that Pound's fascism along with that of other modernists, such as Wyndham Lewis, uh, Heidegger, to a lesser extent, uh, Eliot and W.B. Yeats, uh, with not so much a kind of evil character trait infecting their writing and worldview, but was instead a reflection of their passionate response to the mythological and tribalizing power of the rising electric society. So the fact that specialism was breaking down and collectivism was being retrieved. So my point here is that the successes and failures of modernism must be understood not in terms of an elitist or orally formalist modernist aesthetics, but in terms of the cultural repetition which uh, underlies it. And ironically, but not without reason, I think, the contemporary aesthetics of remix, whose essential basis is that of repetition, uh, fails to acknowledge its own repetition of the modernist moment out of some kind of reactionary impulse. Uh, so in the very useful text, Remix Theory, the aesthetics of sampling, Eduardo Navas emphasizes the close tie between the development of sampling and mechanical reproduction and the rise of modernist aesthetics. So for instance, the movement of Dadaism, which emphasized discontinuity and cultural play, introduced an aesthetics of remix, not only through its photo montage compositions, actually there's one right there, um, but also through the ready maze of Marcel Duchamp, uh, who in 1917 famously displayed a urinal as art, effectively remixing the cultural codes of uh, utility and aesthetic value. Um, so I find it telling that in the context of postmodern remix culture, Navas chooses to emphasize the work of Dadaism as opposed to other strings of modernism, such as Ezra Pound's. Um, so the collages and ready mates Navas emphasizes are examples of artworks that are not original creations, but are recontextualized samples from pre-existing cultural commodities. So accordingly, in these examples, the artist is no longer privileged as the center of an imaginative creation, but in line with postmodernism, is placed in a more modest position as a selector of content and a critic of oppressive uh, cultural values. So this characterization of artistic practice as critique rather than creation of values is fairly widespread in the contemporary art world. Uh, and in fact, it's precisely this emphasis on critical practice that is behind the postmodern antagonism toward what is perceived as the totalizing and elitist aesthetics of modernism. Uh, but I would like to suggest that this postmodern redefinition of art as a primarily critical endeavor uh, is deeply problematic. Uh, and equating conscious perception with critique and analysis rather than creation and synthesis contemporary artistic practice misrepresents the emancipatory power of perception itself, uh, thereby for foreclosing its own desire for political and ethical liberation. So in this sense, I would like to claim that the aesthetics of remix should not be understood as a simple critique of values, but following a media ecological perspective, should be seen as a transformation of the symbolic structures through which reality manifests to us. 
uh, and thus as an opportunity to refashion artistic practice as an unlocking of new paradigms for creative perceptual activity. Uh, since this creative experimentation with perception forms the root of modernist aesthetics, uh, it's here I suggest that contemporary aesthetics would benefit from a conscious repetition of the modernist moment. Now I'll talk a bit more about Pound. So Pound's approach has been called uh, the ideogramic method, so you've seen some examples here. Uh, this is one. Uh, so this was enormously influential to the development of modernist literary form, and even supplied the basis for McLuhan's interpretive approach. So the ideogramic method derives its name from the Chinese ideogram, uh, which for Pound is able to convey a direct sensation of an idea through a juxtaposition of images, um, and it's the fragmentary interplay, um, uh, sorry, the fragmentary interplay between these images that embodies a kind of active energy through which that idea evokes meaning in human consciousness. So it's kind of a direct hitting of you about this energy, the idea, which is different than rational thought. Um, so, as an example, I'm explaining the just descriptive precision of the ideogram. Pound kind of notes that a concept like the color red, see so you've seen that slide there, is most profoundly understood not by abstractly conceptualizing that it is a vibration of light or something like that, but instead by holding a perceptual relation of red things in the mind, such as a rose, a cherry, or a flamingo, and then kind of perceiving the resonances through these forms and having that directly impact you. So according to Pound, however, this metaphorical nature of the ideogram is not distinct to Chinese culture, but also arises in the work of Aristotle and the Aristotelian philosophers of the Middle Ages. So for Aristotle, perception is essentially metaphorical or ideogramic because it implies an intuitive understanding of the similarity of dissimilars. In this sense, perception does not operate through a connected sequence of logical propositions, but instead acts directly on the understanding through apprehending the energetic resonances between effective forms. So in Hugh Kenner's words, Pound's method is to use concatenations of metaphor to isolate, define, and compare qualities of action and passion. So Pound considered his poetic method as a science in the sense that it was like a precise definition of qualities. Um, so in Pound's concern with precise poetic definition, we see a real divergence between the modernist remix of Pound and the postmodern remix made possible by sampling technologies and uh, more recently by computer networks. Uh, Jean Baudrillard gives a compelling account of postmodern remix, a uh, little somewhat vulgar, by, by describing it as a semiotic orgy. Um, so this night, notion might shed light on the action of digital networks, which uh, proliferate, fragment, and recombine archetypes to such an extent that we lose the ability to distinguish meaningful forms. Lev Manovich clarifies this phenomenon through his notion of deep remixability, which refers to the uh, aesthetic language of software design uh, that remixes not only the content from various sources, but also, and more importantly, the very representational techniques which establish the different media worlds of, say, cinematography, animation, graphic design, painting. So these all become deeply blended, I guess, through uh, computational simulation. Uh, so as Manovich notes, the aesthetics of deep remixability extends beyond the more discontinuous collage-style remixing of postmodernism. So this new hybrid computational aesthetics uh, no longer liberates kind of rupture and difference in an ecstatic reaction to the formalist aesthetics of modernism, but instead emphasizes an endless continuity of formal transition to the point at which it is no longer evident where one form ends and another form begins. So in this sense, the aesthetics of deep remixability may fall in line with the more contemporary movement of posthumanism, which precisely emphasizes the inadequacy of symbolic form and finds a new metaphysical foundation in the self-organization of matter itself. Um, so nevertheless, while posthumanism may embody a different aesthetic than postmodernism, I think it is evident that it repeats the essential structure of postmodernism, which is its fundamentally reactive stance toward modernism. So following Baudrillard, we might know that, that if postmodernism constitutes a semiotic orgy, then posthumanism is what occurs after the orgy. So Baudrillard writes, what do we do now that the orgy is over? Now all we can do is simulate the orgy, simulate liberation. We live amid the interminable reproduction of ideals, fantasies, images, and dreams, which are now behind us, yet, yet which we must continue to reproduce in a sort of inescapable indifference. So I think Baudrillard's uh, emphasis on indifference is crucial. 
as I already mentioned, is precisely symbolic indifference or the lack of exact definition which Ezra Pound's whole poetic enterprise was waged against. Further, the emancipatory practice of postmodernism was motivated by the desire to celebrate radical difference in reaction to what was perceived as the totalizing nature of modernism. <clears throat> However, if postmodernism was about expanding the role of difference, uh, I wonder how it ended up in the symbolic indifference of deep remixability. And I think the answer is clear if we employ McLuhan's notion of reversal. So this notion is simply that when a given symbolic function is employed to an extreme extent, uh, it reverses into an opposite complementary form. So we can thus see that through intensifying the power of remix and difference, the medium of confirmation turns postmodern remix into posthuman remix, or radical difference into radical homogeneity, a radical sameness. So we thus paradoxically come full circle to the very totalizing aesthetics of which modernism is accused. Um, and uh, so currently the fascist impulse in modernism reappears in digital networks, is repeated although unconsciously. So I therefore claim that through failing to consciously repeat the modernist concern with symbolic structure and mythology, the aesthetics of deep remixability merely reverses into a new mythology of control. So Ezra Pale's fascism can be traced to his poetic concern for the intricate distinctions through which forms rhythmically articulate themselves in human perception. So in this sense, Pale's modernism was a radical concern for difference that manifested in a fascism which has been insightfully characterized by Walter Benjamin as an aestheticization of politics. So Mussolini was for Pound a visionary artist <clears throat> who through collectivization of the public body would uh, enrich both language and perception toward uh, a recognition of a kind of absolute rhythm of defined difference. Pound's Mussolini was thus a kind of mythological representation of acoustic space, a figure that could program the total environment in terms of radical aesthetic values. In contrast, post-humanism and computational hybridity renounced the elitist perception of symbolic values of modernism to deliver itself to the new mythological figure of the computer. So in other words, Mussolini might be seen as being retrieved, not as programmer of the nation, but as programmer of the total world environment, including the movement of matter itself. So Mussolini retrieved by, by a computational uh, structure. So in post-human theory, therefore, we see a rejection of human symbolism as a philosophical concern and a deep interest in the self-organization of matter, which is revealed by computational models. So this concern with matter itself as the new foundation of experience is so great that the post-human theorist uh, Rosie Brydotti calls it by the proper name Zoe, actually. Um, so, but I find Brydotti's message is problematic um, because she doesn't recognize that this new paradigm of vital, intelligent matter is only another archetypal repetition disclosed by the symbolic resources of the computer. So in this sense, Brydotti's post-humanism doesn't forge what she intends to be a non-human vitalist realism, but instead retreats archetypes of panpsychism and nature worship in a new modification of acoustic space. So the power of human perception to disclose the differential complexity of a symbolic environment is sacrificed to a new totalizing mythology under post-humanism. So uh, Brydotti believes this um, more humble and holistic perspective can resist the desired informational capitalism to commodify all life forms. Uh, I think Brydotti's lack of perception of the symbolic power of computation really aids the homogenizing movement of digital aesthetics whereby formal distinctions collapse so that informational micro-differences can be commodified and engineered to create new sources of value. So as a new form of mythology and control, post-humanism is not only human all too human, but modern all too modern. So the fundamental error, I believe, is that in renouncing the metaphoric perception of modernism, post-humanism fails to perceive the symbolic activity of reversal, um, sorry, uh, yep, reversal, through which the postmodern liberation of difference reverses into the post-human celebration of homogeneity, so really the lack of formal distinction. As McLuhan notes, reversal is an extreme form because it results from an excessive intensi intensification of a symbolic structure. Uh, reversal is also, however, the peak of form because it discloses the hidden ground and archetypal power of the symbolic medium in question. Okay. Um, 
probably a good question. Yeah. So as I see it, uh, the liberating task of contemporary aesthetics and politics is not to re reject the extremist nature of modernism, but to perceive that the latter's fascist inclinations and mythological tendencies result from the failure of modernism to take its extreme perception of difference far enough. They go like two and a half minutes. Okay. <laughs> Almost done. Um, so symbolic models for this kind of uh, extreme perception can be seen in both McLuhan's uh, and also uh, the philosopher Gilles Deleuze's repetition of the modernist moment. Interestingly, Deleuze's work is usually invoked as an inspiration for postmodern and posthumanist uh, post celebrations of difference as inherently democratizing power. Um, but as philosophers Slavoj Žižek and Alain Medu rightly point out, I think, Deleuze's philosophy is actually a pretty elitist one, although not in a oppressive or fascist sense, more than in an uh, aesthetic sense. Uh, like Pale, Deleuze's concern is with the human ability to perceive the complex rhythms of spatio-temporal structure as they continually manifest a consciousness and ever more revealing and differentiated repetitions. And Pound's poetry is extreme in the sense that it carefully juxtaposes a collection of radically different symbolic and emotional elements in order to generate a high tension, a perceptual interchange, and reversal. Um, okay, so maybe I'll skip a little bit. So in this sense, while Pound's poetry retrieves the mythological character of acoustic space, its extreme use of control difference reverses the homogenizing character of mythology into a heightened state of liberatory perception. So unlike postmodernism, this emancipation of difference is not without discrimination, which is why Pound characterizes his poetry as a kind of hierarchy of aesthetic and ethical values. Um, but while a hier this hierarchy is kind of elitist, it should not be intrinsically related to fascism because the selection of values is not so much based on cultural forms in themselves, but is instead based on the degree of intensity by which past cultural forms come into contact with present cultural forms. Now I just want to read a quote from Deleuze on this. Um, so the aesthetic process of selecting values, clarified by Deleuze, and he comments on Nietzsche's concept of eternal return. So Deleuze writes, eternal return alone affects the true selection because it eliminates the average forms and uncovers the superior form of everything that is. The extreme is not the identity of opposites, but rather the univocity of the different. The eternal formlessness of the eternal return itself, throughout its metamorphoses and transformations, eternal return makes the difference because it creates the superior form. If eternal return is a wheel, then it must be endowed with a violent centrifugal movement which expels everything which can be denied. It is a constantly decentered, continually tortuous circle which re revolves only around the, uh, the unequal. Um, so in this passage, Deleuze affirms a poetic method of Pan, which aims to engender a pure and precise apprehension of the intensities and transformations which underlie the diverse symbolic repetitions of human experience. I'm just going to jump to the end here. Um, so I think through consciously repeating the modernist moment as a univocity of the different, holding multiple cultural elements um, in a kind of more coherent, single understanding, um, I think we can uncover the inescapable power of mythology and symbolism, while at the same time remaining detached from their endless and hypnotizing transformations. Uh, so in this way we avoid the mythological tendencies of Pam's fascism, as well as the covert mythologizing of uh, posthumanism. So, um, so I think this kind of delivers us to a more pure perception of symbolic movement itself, rather than being attached to specific mythologies and, um, and symbolisms. Okay, go over there. First, I need to uh, thank everyone for allowing me the chance to, uh, to speak. Um, I'm the one whose train got lost in Nebraska, and I'd be happy to tell you the whole story um, over here sometime. Um, <clears throat> so my presentation was originally scheduled for Thursday morning. Uh, I didn't know I saw Sherlock Holmes empowering observation. I was re-watching a study in pink on the train here, the very long train here. That's the first episode of Mark Gatiss and Stephen Moffat's update of the Sherlock Holmes stories. 
I noticed something that made me pause and replay the scene where Sherlock and Watson are riding in their first, to their first crime scene together. I notice that Sherlock doesn't look inside Watson's phone. He takes it, he looks at the case, at the engraving on the back of the case, at the scuff marks around the charging port, but he doesn't look, but he doesn't turn it on to look at the apps or messages or contact, contacts in order to understand his friend Watson. This led me to a question that has oriented my presentation for today, for today to wit, is Sherlock a Luddite? By Luddite, I don't mean a throwback to the machine smashers of the early 1800s, nor do I mean a colloquial curmudgeon who is a late adapter to any new technology. I'm thinking more along the lines of Robert Atkinson's ideological Ludditism, a group he finds amongst neo-Luddites who are opposing fill-in-the-blank the latest technological innovation because we want to protect people from fill-in-the-blank of the purported harm, job loss, health impact, loss of privacy, a degraded environment, loss of freedom, etc. While Atkinson is opposed to these new ideological Luddites, his condemnation brings together a few notable Luddites we might know. Neil Postman, who is condemned for saying, but it is time for us to be grown-ups, to understand that technology gives us something, it will always take away something. And Jacques Ellul, who is condemned for being a lonely voice providing a general critique of technology in the post-war era. Certainly the Luddites smashed knitting machines, but as Richard Conniff explains in his article, What the Luddites Really Fought Against, they were not opposed to technology, nor were they opposed to progress. Conniff writes, getting past the myth and seeing their protest more clearly is a reminder that it's possible to live well with technology, but only if we, continue, if we continually question the ways it shapes our lives. It's about small things, like now and then cutting the cord, shutting down the smartphone, and going out for a walk. But it needs to be about the big things, too, like standing up against technologies that put money or convenience above other human values. If we don't want to become, as Carlisle warned, mechanical in head and heart, it may help every now and then to ask which of our modern machines General and Eliza Ludd would choose to break, and which they would choose to break them with. Thus, being a Luddite is more than being against technology, it's being selective in one's use of technology and being aware of how the te that technology we use uses us. I'm interested in Thomas Pynchon's Luddite. The Luddite with the controlled martial arts type anger of the dedicated badass, who embodies the complex love-hate that grows up between humans and machinery, especially when that machinery has been around for a while. For Pynchon, what gave King Ludd, the historical leader of the Luddites, his special bad charisma was that he went up against these amplified, multiplied, more than human opponents and prevailed. For Pynchon, the animating soul of King Ludd's followers is the desire for miracles. Thus, in the computer age, the Luddites don't destroy the computer because it is a miraculous machine. As Pynchon argues, the deepest Luddite hope of miracles has come to reside in the computer's ability to get the right data to those whom the data will do the most good. With the proper deployment of budget and computer time, we will cure cancer, save ourselves from nuclear extinction, grow food for everybody, detoxify the results of industrial greed gone berserk, realize all the wistful pipe dreams of our days. So a Luddite, as I'm using the moniker here, is someone who inspects the implications of technology in order to weigh its worth against its cost, and then inspires others to take action. Sherlock's method. Sherlock is the most mediated literary character of all time, according to Alan Barnes, who followed up by quipping, you can actually study the entire development of cinema by watching Sherlock Holmes films, including a recently rediscovered uh, 1918 film that's being shown in uh, California. Sherlock's enduring popularity and his constancy despite his frequent reincarnation comes down to his method, or to borrow from our computer science friends, his algorithm. Sherlock's method is an algorithm. It's a self-contained, step-by-step set of operations to be performed. The steps Sherlock describes are observation, deduction, and knowledge. Though as Seebach and Unker Seebach uh, argue uh, in uh, an article, Sherlock Holmes and his method, <coughs> Uh, the simplest and most, let's see, uh, the steps are better described as observation, abduction, and knowledge. 
They argue that what makes Sherlock so successful as a detective is his ability to select the hypothesis that is simplest and most natural, is the easiest and cheapest to test, and yet will contribute to our understanding of the widest possible range of facts. Furthermore, Sherlock, by maintaining objectivity, outstrips the official police force because where they select a hypothesis that accounts for a few outstanding facts, they neglect the more mundane facts and even refuse to consider data that do not support their pet hypotheses. Um, that uh, understanding of hypothesis may be familiar to anyone who's um, in with Charles Sanders' purse and pragmaticisms, maybe. Right. Uh, an example uh, might make this a little more interesting, so here goes. In a scene from The Sign of the Four, Moffat adopted when writing this lady, the, um, A Study in Pain, Watson gives Sherlock a challenge. I have heard you say it is difficult for a man to have any object daily in use without leaving the impress of his individuality upon it in such a way that a trained observer might read it. Now I have a watch which has recently come into my possession. Would you have the kindness to let me have an opinion upon the character or habits of the late owner? Sherlock takes up the watch and the challenge, and upon close examination of the watch, he concludes that it had originally belonged to Watson's father, was then passed to his elder brother, which brother was a man of unruly, untidy habits, very untidy and careless. He was left with good prospects, but he threw away his chances, lived for some time in poverty with occasional short intervals of prosperity, and finally, taking to drink, he died. Sherlock's method, which led to these conclusions, was to observe the watch, noting its dents and deep scratches, its engravings, both inside and out. Then, he selected the best hypotheses to explain what he observed. Finally, he relied on his database of knowledge to test these hypotheses. When he notices the dents and deep scratches on a 50-guinea watch, Sherlock hypothesis, hypothesizes that the watch was kept in a pocket with coins and keys, a simple hypothesis, easy to test, and which contributes to our understanding of the previous owner of the watch. Likewise, when Sherlock discovers pawnbroker's marks inside the case, he hypothesizes that the previous owner fell on hard times, pawned the watch, made some money, and redeemed the watch, only to pawn it again. This hypothesis is natural, easy to test against Holmes' knowledge of pawnbrokers and their clientele, and contributes a great deal to his understanding of Watson's brother. Finally, the key, rather the key hole, which shows signs of fumbling with the key for winding the pocket watch. From the observation, Holmes formed the hypothesis that Watson's elder brother took to drink. It is a simple and natural explanation for the scuffs. It is easily tested and gives Sherlock great insight into the deceased. In a sense, Sherlock Holmes is a very artistic database query tool. I would step back from Holmes' uh, abductions for a moment and follow up on that thought. Sherlock as a computer program. Donald Muth, uh, in an article proposing the art of computer programming, explained that the advantage of science is that it saves us from the need to think through in each individual case. We can turn our thoughts to higher level concepts. Science is knowledge which we understand so well that we can teach it to a computer. And if we don't fully understand something, it's an art to deal with it. Since the notion of an algorithm or a computer program provides us with an extremely useful test for the depth of our knowledge about any given subject, the process of going from an art to a science means that we learn how to automate something. So what I'm saying here is that Sherlock is the result of having taught science to a computer. Everything that Victorian science knew, Dr. Doyle programmed into Sherlock, and Dr. Doyle was no slouch in contemporary science. Having earned an academic degree in medical and a medical degree from the best medical school of his day, pursued a specialization in ocular surgery. Furthermore, every new iteration of Sherlock adds to his database of knowledge, from Basil Rathbone to Benedict Cumberbatch. With Benedict Cumberbatch, Sherlock, the star of BBC's revival show, we are back to where we started, in the back of the cab with Sherlock and Watson, where Sherlock looks at Watson's phone, but not in it. He doesn't turn it on, explore John's contacts, look at his Candy Crush score, review his Snapchats, but he seems to know almost everything about John Watson by the impressions of his individuality on an object that was daily in his use. And I think it's because Sherlock was a Luddite. Sherlock seems to recognize that the things in our phones are cute distractions which prevent us from employing his method. Sherlock is an algorithm. We do not yet fully understand the science of deduction that method to which he dedicated his life, so we still need an art to deal with him. We need Moffat to write his stories and Cumberbatch to act them out. But at the same time, Sherlock is that miracle of the computer age that the Luddites hoped for. 
He has, as Pynchon says, the ability to get the right data to those whom the data will do the most good. As Knuth says, he saves us from the need to think things through in each individual case so that we can turn our thoughts to higher level concepts. He smashes through the biased hypotheses of those who cannot or will not accept the mundane facts which undermine those hypotheses. We certainly have uh, a lot of time for questions.